um, and we can go ahead and get going. But before we do, I always like to start with what what do you know about authentic assessment? What does that mean to you? Where where are you coming from? Anybody? I think, Josh, you and I had some good conversations last summer about trying to make sure that the assessment is not just what we've always done in our field, but is really getting at what we want students to learn. Absolutely. Um, and, and giving them opportunities to display that they've learned that thing rather than saying, this is an English class, so you should be writing a paper. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Wholeheartedly agree. Although, there is definitely something to be said for writing papers, especially in an I'm English class. Trying to trash writing papers <laughs> especially as an English teacher, I'm a big fan of writing papers in addition to other things. So yes, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Excellent, excellent. Hey, Lisa and Julia, welcome back. <laughs> Anybody else have any thoughts on authentic assessments before we get going? Do we know what they are? Do we want... Hey, Julia. One of the things that comes to mind for me in authentic assessment is it's an assessment that the student can use in some way to, to sort of understand what they've learned and what they've yet to, to master. That's a cool way of looking at it. Very nice, Peter. I like that. I never considered it from that from that point of view, but that's an excellent, excellent point. It does. I like it. Thank you. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and present again. I've plugged up my other monitor, so hopefully now I can both see you and see my presentation. So let's see if it works. All right, can you see my little PowerPoint thingy? Yes. Perfect. So it is working as intended. Excellent. So authentic assessments, we're going to basically start with um, what are they? And then I'm going to give you a few examples just to make sure we're all on the same page with what we're talking about when we say authentic assessments. And then we are going to be talking about benefits and challenges. Benefits and challenges are going to be discussed kind of in relation to traditional assessments. Talking about opportunities. Um, and opportunities, if you were with us for the last one, basically means overcoming those challenges. So opportunities for overcoming. And then some best and practices, ending with some Q&A as always. So... What is an authentic assessment? Basically, it's an assessment that requires students to apply what they've learned, is really what it comes down to, and especially to apply what they've learned in a new situation or in a like real-life situation. This is contrasted with traditional assessments, which are, um, generally speaking, kind of esoteric in relation to the real world, such as a quiz or a test. And to some extent a paper depending on the context. In an English class writing a paper would be an authentic assessment because you are teaching them how to write. That's the content. Mm -hmm. But in like a um, for example a dance class or a computer science class writing a paper would not be an authentic assessment because you're they're not applying what they're supposed to be learning. So um, authentic assessments are meant to replicate real-world contexts oftentimes. Oftentimes you'll have them be kind of assuming the identity of someone of a, of a real person or a real world thing and then doing what they would do. Um, authentic assessments are going to require judgment and oftentimes innovation and they often involve a process of recursive improvement where they get feedback from the instructor, from their peers, from other people. That's one of my favorite things. If we can do it, the problem with that one is that it takes forever. So you have to kind of balance the, the wonderful joy of recursive um, improvement and, and this kind of this iterative process where you go over the same thing and make it better and better with, hey, this is going to take me a month to do, and I'm going to have to grade it four times to get it done to them, so you have to kind of balance those two things. So some examples, and I've done this in several different fields, um, an example of a authentic assessment in business might be to create a business plan for a company in their desired field. So there is a real world context. In psychology, they might examine a case study for multiple theoretical positions. In statistics, they could collect and analyze data from their peers, such as their sleep habits or their free time or, or things like that. Education, they're creating lesson plans, delivering mock lessons, analyzing assessment results, things like that. Things that actual real teachers do in the real world. Graphic design, I love, I wish Nate was here. He does such a great job with this, creating a new logo for local businesses. He has this whole project where he has them work with all these different industries on, on creating logos and choosing fonts and all kinds of amazing stuff. If you're interested in that, talk to Nate. He, I'm sure he'd love to talk about it. He does a great job with that. Um, some of the benefits of 
um, authentic assessments. They focus on higher level learning. If you're not familiar with higher level learning, I suggest you check it out. Here's a quick link to it. But basically, we're talking about Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy is a very rough primer. There are six different levels. The lower levels are um, basically the sh more shallow that your understanding is. In order to remember something, you don't really have to understand it very well. I can spout off to you some biology definitions, but I have no idea what they actually mean. I can tell you what gamete meiosis is, but I have no idea what it actually means or how it applies in anything. Um, there's understanding and then applying, so you, in order to really understand something, um, you might have to describe it or something, and then to apply, you obviously need to apply it, all the way up to create. And those of you who did QM training, by the way, this should look familiar. Um, but create is, is the highest level because you are creating new things, for, you're, you're kind of um, taking what you have, the information you have, and synthesizing it into something new. These create, evaluate, and, and analyze are where you want to get your students. That's not to say that you don't need these bottom four, because you definitely do. You need students to remember things and understand things and be able to apply things. But that's the foundation to build upon, and up here are the ones that we actually need to get them to. This is where all the magic happens, the create, analyze, I'm sorry, create, evaluate, and analyze. So authentic assessments allow us to get to those higher level learning much more easily than traditional assessments. Now, can you get to the evaluate? You hear an echo. That's a good idea. Thank you, Gay. Ev let's everybody mute. It looks, um, if you would, and then if you have a question, just unmute and let me know. Um, so the it's much easier with um, authentic assessments to reach those high level of learning as opposed to a traditional assessment. Because in a traditional assessment, can you formulate questions that require students to evaluate things and analyze things? Yes, you can. You definitely can. They are much more challenging to do, and I can't think of a way you can formulate a multiple choice question that has a student create anything. I cannot imagine a way for you to do that. It might be theoretically possible. I've just never seen it or never heard of anybody doing it. So it's much easier to get these top three through formative assessments. Um, you, could, you also get a much more accurate understanding of student achievement instead of their rote memorization skills. Because tests, I am very, very good at tests. I got a 35 on the ACT. I'm not that smart. I'm just very good at tests. So my wife is the opposite. She is extremely intelligent, but she is terrible at tests. If you let her talk to you about a, t a topic, you'll be blown away. But if you give her a multiple choice test on it, she'll fail it most of the time. It's these kind of things that authentic assessments help us with. They get rid of those test skills that are so focused nowadays in the K-12 system, by the way, it makes me angry, but and focus more on actual understanding of the content and actual development of skills related to the content. Because they're, the, the way that you test it is they use those skills, and either they learned the skills or they didn't. And if they didn't, it's obvious that they didn't. There's no way to really fake it. And it tells you, and it'll, it, it builds learning experiences for them to be able to develop those skills along the way. Generally speaking, they're much more engaging for students, depending on how you formulate them. You can make an authentic assessment that's terribly disengaging and awful, but generally speaking, they're going to be much more engaging for your students than sitting there and taking a 100-question quiz, or test, rather. Um, they help prepare students for the real world, because how often in the real world do you actually sit down and take a test? Maybe the GRE? certification exams, maybe in, in certain fields, but generally speaking, you're not doing that in the real world. I haven't taken a test in forever, um, but I do stuff with my skills all the time, just like all of you do. And it also takes uncertainty out of the assessment. On a test, you might tell your students, hey, these are this is the subject matter. This is a comprehensive test over these four chapters or whatever, and they have to study those four chapters. They never know what's on the test. They don't know what skills necessarily are going to be assessed. So it's kind of a, a, a nerve-wracking thing. But with an authentic assessment, they know exactly what skills they're going to have to demonstrate. They know exactly what they're supposed to do. You explain it over and over again. You lay out for them exactly what is required of them, what they're going to need to know, what specific skills and what they have to do. So it kind of takes the, the traditional flips on its head. Traditional, you guard those test questions with your life. You don't let anybody see them unless they cheat. Authentic, you give it all away. You say, here's all the information I can give you and ask me questions and I'll give you more because we don't care about the rote memorization questions. We care about you applying the skills that you have developed and you can't fake that, or at least not very easily. It's harder to fake it than it is to actually just do it.
Any questions or anything those thus far? Sorry, I get kind of passionate about the authentic assessment. <laughs> this is my teacher coming through. There are, however, some challenges with authentic assessment as opposed to traditional assessment. They take longer is the big one. That's the main one. If you have a quiz or a test, you can knock that out in the class period. In, a, in, a, in just a meeting, you can be done with it. Or if it's a quiz, you can do it in the first 10 minutes of class, and you're done, and you're ready to roll. Authentic assessment takes longer because you have to create it, you have to explain it to your students, you have to give them time to work on it and prepare and create the thing they're creating, so it does take more time. Also, it's complex. Authentic assessments by design and by definition are more complex, meaning that you're going to have to choose how complex to make them depending on your students, and you're also going to have to figure out how to relate those um, complexities to your students in a way that they can understand and they can access and accomplish. And finally, grading. A lot of people have trouble with authentic assessments because they say, oh, it's not valid, it's not reliable, you don't, you're, it's, it's, so obje it's not objective, it's so subjective because it depends on how much you like it as an instructor. We are going to talk about each opportunities to overcome each of these three things, or at least mitigate some of them. As far as time goes, you can build learning assess opportunities into the assessment. So instead of saying, okay, here's assessment time, and now here's instruction time, you can kind of combine those two. You have a lot of overflow with authentic because they're practicing the skills that you're supposed to be teaching them. You can have them be building the things for their authentic assessment as you teach it to them. Um, so it's, Peter, were you going to say anything? Okay. So you can have them building those things and you can have those learning opportunities built into those assessments along the way. Um, I also, one thing I love to do is to break the assessment, the authentic assessment into little parts and have them complete them over time, combining it in the end. To give you an example of this, in um, EDCIT 570, which is um, educational technology, uh, my students, they're, the entire course, the six-week master's course, is based around um, problem-based learning and how, the, how students can, can learn about project-based learning. I'm sorry, project-based learning. And throughout that entire course, we build a giant project-based learning lesson that they can go ahead and take and apply in their classroom. Week one, we start with the setup, and they complete some forms to help set it up. Week two, they take those forms and kind of expand them into some more um, activities. Week three, they create a web quest that they're going to incorporate into their project-based learning thing. Week four, they build on that. Week five, it just, it just builds on itself. And in the final week, there's nothing new. They're taking all that stuff that they've already done, revising it based on feedback from me and their peers, and putting it all together into, co into a cohesive unit. So this entire thing is just one long, protracted, authentic assessment. There are little pieces, and they get grades for each little piece, but then the final one where they put it all together, they're not... It's not like this amazing giant thing that they're having to do at the end. They're simply taking all the stuff and fitting it together. Um, and then also, in order to overcome the grading aspect, a lot of people say, oh, it's too subjective. Use a rubric. Use, if you use a well-designed rubric for grading, you will be objective and reliable and valid. Well-designed is the objective word, or the objective hyphenated word there, I linked one resource from ASU that has good, um, this is one that I like to talk about, it has a lot of information about rubrics, best practices, so on and so forth, but really when it gets down to it, make sure that your rubric is things that are objectively measurable. You can't say, does a good job at this. You have to say something like, meets these three specific criteria. For, um, for example, let me see, if, let me find one. I should have found one beforehand, but I am a failure, it seems. So I'll find you one for the um, for my web development class. I was just working on this the other day. If Google decides to load eventually. To 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 today, Google. There we go. Please open. Okay, well, Google hates me, so it's not going to open. I will um, send it out later if you're interested. Basically, what it comes down to is I have things that are very specifically measurable. Your code contains X number of comments in order to um, highlight the things. Your, your users are able to click um, here in order to hide the, the, this item. 
you incorporated this framework, that kind of thing. Very specific, objective, measurable things. Sometimes you can't be objective because in a lot of times, especially in um, like the arts and things like that, it's a lot more challenging to do that. So you have to add a little bit of subjectivity into it. However, your rubric needs to um, have be as objective as possible. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts about how to do that in your specific discipline or any problems doing that? Any, anything you can reason you wouldn't be able to do that? All right. Excellent. That's good news. So as for some best practices, please use backwards design. This is something that, that in my opinion, everybody should be doing all the time anyway. But it, in case you're not, in case you're not familiar with it, because this is kind of an education-specific thing, it's based off the a book written by, um, was it Hughes and McTie? Let me find it. Hughes, it's in here somewhere. Wiggins and McTie. Wiggins and McTie wrote a book called Understanding by Design. The basic premise of it is that traditionally, a lot of people started designing their courses by first saying, "Okay, what do I want to talk about?" and then they talk, and then they kind of write down their instructional ideas. I'm going to talk about this topic and this topic and this topic, and then they plan out their lectures and plan out their course calendar, and they go back and say, okay, what type of assessment do I want to use? I'm going to put in a quiz here, here, and here. I'm going to have them write this paper here and here, whatever. The, um, understanding by design or backwards design flips that on its head. It says, okay, instead of that, first off, what do I want my students to leave with? What knowledge, what, what learning objectives do I want them to leave with? Then, before I plan any type of instruction, I go into my assessments and I create my final assessments. All of my assessments need to be created before I can really plan out my instruction. The, the reason for this is because how do I know that I met all my assessments, that my assessments actually assess what I want them to and that I cover that stuff if I haven't already created them? So I need to know where we're headed before I figure out how to get there. So if that's that's... There's a lot more to it, but that's the basic idea behind it, is that you start with the ending and work backwards. The last thing you make are your, your lectures or your things like that. You, you, plan that. you plan out your calendar. That's the last thing you do instead of the first thing, which most people use. Um, also, you should introduce this assessment, any, any formative, I'm sorry, any authentic assessments you do as early as possible. This kind of goes along with the whole idea of giving students as much information about them as possible. Introduce them as early as possible. With, I mean, obviously, don't say, all right, welcome to class day one. We have 17 authentic assessments. The first one is, you don't want to do that, obviously. But as soon as it becomes relevant, tell them about it. Even if you don't go into super details about it, just let them know, hey, here's this, this unit. At the end of this unit, you're going to be making a business plan. And then roll with it. And then as once the time comes to introduce it, you will have already told them, hey, this you're going to be doing a business plan. And it kind of helps break that down, which leads nicely into explicitly break down that task into small chunks. One of the things that I hear a lot of times from professors that our students are lacking and that college students in general are lacking is the ability to analyze tasks and break them down into manageable components. That's something that you and I have picked up, but a lot of our students don't know how to do that. They haven't figured out how to look at the big picture and then look and then break it into manageable chunks. So we as instructors have two choices. Number one, we can just kind of throw them in the deep end and say best of luck and then kind of laugh as they drown, or we can help them and break it down into chunks explicitly for them. And, and what I do, and this is just me, I say, if I were to do this project, I would focus first on this first part, spend probably two or three days on it and then tell them exactly what to do. I would go to the library and research this, or I would go on the internet and research this, and then for the second part, now that I'm, I'm looking for an annotated bibliography, I'm going to, in the first part I wrote down my sources, in the second one I'm gonna go back, look over them, and write a quick summary of each one. And the next part, and then just continue, yada, yada, yada. So I am explicitly and concretely breaking down the tasks to these students. If you can incorporate student interests, this is a little bit more challenging, um, especially now that we are socially distant because you don't get to know your students as well as we used to be able to, which is unfortunate but true. However, if you can learn about your students' interests, you can sometimes fold them into your authentic assessments. 
one authentic assessment I did in high school was we did a zombie survival thing for um, research. I've talked about this before. I don't know. I'm sorry if I am repeating myself to any of you, but basically students, we pretended that it, there was a zombie apocalypse. Students had to try to survive, and I threw challenges at them saying, hey, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, so on and so forth. And they had to do, perform research on what they wanted to do and then cite it using proper MLA, MLA citation, so on and so forth, turn that stuff in. Did I have to toss in zombies to teach them MLA citation? No. But I still get messages from those kids five years later saying how much they enjoyed that project and how they're now using their MLA stuff for their, um, for their college. So, no, I didn't have to do that, but by dang it, it worked. So, can I... Uh, yes, please. Yeah, can I... Um, so, for my IS200 class, Introduction to Interdisciplinary Studies, um, both in class and online... Um, I have them do an interdisciplinary research project, which even the textbook, as it sort of lays out the process, drags out over three chapters. So basically, it lends itself to a three-step setup. And I notice that it is in, both in in class and um, like both in seat and online. It is helpful if I include um, a quick lecture explaining how the three parts. You know, first designing a research question, that's the first one, and then, you know, doing the actual research, and then um, something about, you know, figuring out how it's interdisciplinary. So there are multiple steps. And if I have on the board or in a lecture a visual representation how the three things build on each other and then become one, you know, process paper, basically, in the end. They don't even have to write a research paper for that. They just have to talk about the process of researching. Um, but making that visible... With um, uh, with like a slide lecture or doing it on the board and showing them the three parts coming together is incredibly helpful because they're so used to just following sort of a now we do this chapter and it's over and now we do that chapter and then it's over and we move on and so explaining to them how the three things will come together and they will basically have all the material for the last part with my feedback that I gave all along these three steps having a visual in there and then laying that out before we even move towards the um, creating deck, actually doing the project, has been really useful. So the first couple of years I did it, or the first couple of times I taught it, I would do it, and then I would be surprised that they didn't grasp the fact that we were in the middle of this project. Like, they didn't, you know, they didn't understand that we were, even though the textbook chapter and the syllabus, they all laid out, but the visual really helped. So then they were like, oh, that's what we're doing. So that's... You may want to put a slide in there. <laughs> it actually says, look, here are the three things that actually come together. Chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. See? And then it's cool. Anyway. That's it awesome. seems really basic. It seems surprising because I was like, how can they not get that? But they don't. Because that's not how they used to learn. They used to learning as like, you know, chunked out and then each time there's a quiz and it's over. So um, that's, you know, it was worth it doing it visually. Thank you so much. I wholeheartedly agree. And that problem you you, um, you pointed out, the, f the fact that they're used to be having a chunk and they don't understand how things interrelate with each other, that's that's a very systemic thing. That's not just higher ed. That's all throughout all of it. Um, so thank you so much for that. That's awesome. You can also... Oh, I'm presenting to everyone, it says. You can also allow as much creative freedom and meaningful choice as you can. By doing this, you're going to give students agency. You're going to give them freedom to make their own choices, which may, will make it more theirs. They will take higher ownership of that project, and which means they will put forth more effort because it will be more theirs. It will be their baby. Instead of them doing my thing, they're doing their thing. So obviously you do need to have um, your, your learning objectives and everything outlined first, but try and let them have as much freedom as possible. For example, in the web design one, I lay out what my students have to do. They have to use these frameworks, they have to do do this code to make to, to prove they know how to do it, but they can make it look like whatever they want. They can pick their own colors, they can pick the layout, they can pick they can add other frameworks if they want to. They can add additional functionality if they want to. They can do all this other stuff if they want to. And in fact, they have to do something. Even if they make it as boring as possible, they're still making that choice because I'm not telling them what it's going to look like. Um, use a well-designed rubric. already talked about that briefly until Google kind of gave me the finger and laughed. 
and then have an, equi um, an example project. If at all possible, if you've done this before, keep an exemplar or keep something that's not very good or both and then go over each one using the rubric line by line. I find out that I find that a lot excuse me, I find that a lot of students don't read the rubrics. Or if they do, they don't really understand what they mean. And that just blows me away. I never have understood that and I probably never will. But if you explicitly go over that rubric with them with a project line by line saying Okay, everybody, let's look at the first line on the rubric. Where do you think this project scored and why? Talk with your groups, and then we're going to come back together. Take 30 seconds. Okay, where do you think it scored? Where do you think it scored? Where do you think it scored? Okay, why did you say a 5 when you said a 3? Well, 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 and you say, well, look at the rubric. What's it say? That's a 3. That's not a 5. Why did you give it a 5 kind of thing? That way they're, they're going to say, okay, this is how I'm going to be graded. And if you do that once, maybe twice, they start to really pay more attention to those rubrics. And the sad part is it doesn't get any better in grad school. I have so many students who, who are just like, what is wrong with you? Where's, it's, where, where, where? It's not on the rubric at all. Anyway, enough of that. And that's really the only thing, the only prep or whatever I had. We've got plenty of time for discussion or questions or anything like that if y'all would like. This one has a lot more, a lot less nuts and bolts than the other ones we've gone over today so far. So are there, do y'all have any thoughts, comments, cries of outrage? I always have a thought. Sorry, Peter, if you can go first, though. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, um, could you point us to, or do you know of some particularly good uh, examples of authentic assessments um, that maybe we could uh, reflect on or, or gain inspiration from? Um, let me see if I can find them. I, I looked at a set. Um, I think I googled this and, and searched several of them. Is it the NEA toolbox? If this isn't it, I'll, I'll try and find one. No, this is the one that got stuck okay. in the boot loop. I'll try and find some and send them out. Yeah, that'd be great, just to have as a resource. Okay, thank you. Let me make a note so thank I don't you. forget. So, my comment was going to be that it, um, I do a lot of, um, rather than quizzes, I never use quizzes and exams at all, So, but I do um, a lot of um, responses in Blackboard. Uh-huh. Um, where they actually have to respond to very specific questions and use examples of their own from their own experience. So that helps me then realize, like, I understand whether they know, not just whether they've read the text, but they also understand how it relates to an actual event or experience that they have or something that they know. So they can make that connection, and I think um, we're better off than just them regurgitating whatever's in the text. So they have to... Like everybody writes something different and make very clear that I don't expect the same answer from everybody, that it's all going to be individualized answers. And then I do actually give them pretty specific feedback and thank them for making specific connections so they know that I'm reading. And it sounds super high um, work intensive because I do actually respond to each Blackboard post they put up there. And especially if it's an evening class and it's, you know, and, and I get, um, you know, 20 posts twice a week, and they each, you know, these students start to write a lot because they have thoughts that they want to share and they get really engaged. But it is worth it because you end up having so much less trouble in getting them, like, to do the stuff you need them to do. Like, they become so much more self-motivated that you have to do less in terms of, um, you know, doing outreach and following up and all that kind of stuff and, like, and, and going back to material because... They, um, they do take more ownership, and they feel that they're being heard. So in the end, I always feel like it is worth that extra time because it cuts down on the struggle in another, you know, in another area of trying to keep them engaged. So they usually really like that class because they feel like, oh, my God, everything's beginning to make sense. But it's mostly them articulating what they're learning and why it's important. And especially for AS that's ongoing for the majors, too, because... That's one of the main goals that I have. Can you articulate what you're doing and what, how that is different from, um, from, a, um, from a traditional single major? So um, that is one of the back-end goals that I'm actually working towards. So then I say, how do I make that happen? Oh, you know, they just keep having to articulate it throughout the semester at various points and have these moments in there. And that's all written, or you can do it, I guess, spoken as well, but it's easier if it's just 
Awesome. Thank you. Josh, I was, I was just going to say, um, one of the, one of the, I guess, techniques or strategies that I think education kind of lends itself to authentic assessment, because not only are we using them, we're teaching them to these prospective teachers or teacher candidates, yeah. but, um, they, I, I, they latch on to the, the raft idea kind of quickly as far as, and, and that's probably something so common, but I don't know, is it more education? Um, and I didn't know, I was just going to throw that out there as an example that I use with my students to say this is a form of authentic assessment that they kind of start to get the idea of choice and being able to accept. They ha sometimes struggle with wanting to accept different formats. Can you real quick before you, you know, go on, could you could tell us real quickly what are you talking about? You're talking about raft writing, I assume. I for, think that's kind of yeah, education centric yes. for the most part. For the mo for the most part, yes. And so I would tell them with my third grade, and I always use my own classroom experiences. So um, when we were studying colonial America, my third graders could write a letter to, um, you know, if you were, and then you have to figure out your voice. Who are you in the letter? So what's your role? Are you a um, are you a patriot? <laughs> are you know? Um, are and who are you writing to? Are you writing to your neighbor who doesn't agree? Or are you writing to the King of England? Or and and so and what is your format? Um, so I'm saying writing, but are you writing a letter? Are you creating a poster that you're going to put in the local tavern? Um, and and what is your topic? So what are you? And normally with young children, you have to limit. I have to give them a task and then broaden it as they get more capable but so i guess um role audience format how are you going to present it and what's your topic mm -hmm. right yes that's that's how that's how i learned so, it as well i, I just I, I feel like that lends itself in especially you know music dance certainly writing I wholeheartedly agree. I loved, I use raft stuff all the time because it is authentic and it'll, it forces students to consider things that oftentimes they won't, especially their audience or the role of the writer. Because oftentimes when you're writing, or every time when you write, you should be considering your audience. Because I'm not going to write the same if I'm writing to my wife as I am if I'm writing to a board of trustees or who, whatever else. Um, but by offering that, especially if you let them choose a lot of those things... Right. It gives them that ownership as well. So I, I love that you brought that up. I love that, that strategy. If y'all have if the rest of y'all haven't haven't heard of that, raft raft riding or raft is wonderful. Anybody else have any thoughts on authentic assessment? Anybody have any anything they'd like to try that we could brainstorm or whatever? I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. Yeah, I have a question. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, I've, I've done a few times, um, but with upperclassmen and uh, where I have a pro big project and then there are steps to get to that project. Mm -hmm. um, I've done with, with first year students, and that's the question revolves around, you know, 18, 19 year olds, um, where I've used a, um, we've used books um, that were sort of, all the readings were focused on a particular theme. And the response I get from the students, why do we have to, we're the whole semester about the same thing. How do you get away? How do you, uh, you know, I think it's part of it is maturity because as the, the older they get, it's no problem. We can work on a big project and we have all these components. But in freshman comp, you know, spending a whole semester, and that's why I, I'm kind of, moved away from those books, but it's all the same. And that's what they, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, isn't this interesting? We're looking at different angles, different, and it's like, they're just poo-pooing my whole <laughs> thing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, I like that. I have no problem with the idea. I've got lots of ideas, but I'm, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate. How do you get, and you, you know, you're focusing, you're, you're asking us to look at from the student's perspective, but to really engage them so that they're, there will always be some that are just like, oh, yeah. oh, you know, I want to do something else. I'm done with this. And again, it's partly because it's sort of a traditional way of educating, you know, 
we're done with this project, we move to the next one. We move to the next one rather than looking at connections. So, you know, I'm envious of Julia's students who are <laughs> and want to do it. And I met, I, I, I've been <laughs> Come on, do it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> just make them do it. <laughs> when I talk about the comp courses where I have yeah. done that, where my topic was immigration. So basically, I used a lot of primary texts, right? Mm -hmm. Always a lot more than we're asked to use. Sorry, Andrea. And then um, also, no, I know you don't care. <laughs> we're all good. We're all good. But, um, so, um, but I also um, used different ways along the way, like different reflection moments where I said, how does this add to our understanding of whatever conflict? How does this new text or this new character, you know, bring a new perspective or how has, how have things changed over time? Because they come from different time periods, right? So basically asking the students to make those connections so that they feel that they're actually getting a more in-depth understanding of the how does this character solve the problem better or differently than this other character, for example, in another book, in another whatever? And you're making sort of artificial connections because really these people will never meet, so it doesn't really matter. But there are ways that um, I think they can begin to see like, oh, it's really complicated and it changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why this might be, well, I don't know if it's interesting, but at least they're engaged in like responding mm -hmm. or reflecting on it. Another possible thing you might consider is toss is breaking it up with short texts or short um, sources that are like different, like widely different in style or something than the rest. Um, especially if it's something more modern, because a lot of times, like for example, we were, when we were reading about Shakespeare, students get bogged down because oh, Shakespeare is Satan, even though I personally love him. Um, but then if you throw in something much more modern that's still on the same theme. Then you can then you can kind of get around it, especially if you say, "Here's five things you could read. Pick two of them, and here's a very short synopsis of them, and those are going to supplement the main texts." Yeah, I mean, what we're reading is contemporary, and uh, most of it is nonfiction, and then we have some fiction as well. But it's it's I'm I'm using very contemporary. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going. This is you know, and it's the, the focus is writing. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, so that that part yeah I've taken care of I'm really zero okay, so something good. that's that's you know that they can and that they can kind of draw connections to very relevant uh, relevant issues going on right now current yeah. yeah so like when you're having them write you you mentioned that you're having them draw connections to current issues so if you're if you're having them write and read about things that are related to Black Lives Matter, I can guarantee you're going to have a lot more engagement just based on the current event and the fact that it, it is so personal to so many of our students. So I, th yeah. I think that's awesome that you're doing that. That's a great way to help with that. Well, to be more specific, the focus is language and the power of language and how we use language. And so there's, you know, language of conflict, uh -huh. there's language of immigration, the language is everywhere. So you can, whatever topic, you can link it to language. And so it really lends itself very nicely. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant, I'm nervous about how are they going to, whether they're going to accept this one big project with lots of little components. I just have to make that work. That's my challenge. Well, you also have the option of instead of, instead of doing one big project for whole semester, do a project that goes for three weeks or, or something like that. Oh, yeah. They'll all connect, and then they'll be using all those little components in their big at the end. Yes. I got gotcha. you. Yes. Um, yeah. hmm. You might for your large project might just be a portfolio of their work where it doesn't necessarily have to be closely related by theme or, or, or any of that type of stuff. It could just be, I'm just, I'm, I have no idea. I'm just brainstorming possible ideas. Yeah, no, I, I know. I mean, it, it's, this is something that I, I think it, it'll, it's a long-term issue that I'm kind of trying to figure out. how. <laughs> Yeah. And composition is kind of notoriously difficult to get students engaged in because they don't really care about grammar. <laughs> they don't really care about sentence variation and structure for the most part. Well, and yes, now I may have, I don't know if we've had this personal conversation or not, but 
I think moving to higher education from where I came from being the elementary classroom, I expected students to understand that writing had, for instance, organization. <laughs> that you, I mean, we have so many different, I'm, I'm not, I know I'm telling you something you know, but I guess what I'm saying is I have become frustrated, I've been frustrated because I really didn't realize that I would still be doing some of the same writing as I did in third grade, but on a different level, but the same concepts are there as far as you have no topic sentence. I need your details. I, you know, I need you to, you said this in your introduction and then you never told me any more about it. So I, I just, I just, I think I just wanted to tell you that misery loves company and <laughs> that I have really, really struggled with the trying to give the students what they need as far as the writing goes. And then there's also so much content that also, you know, anyway, so forgive me for rattling. I'm not sure what I was saying except that I hear you. <laughs> like we all do. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a huge challenge with these authentic mm -hmm. assessments because I, you know, at least I think you and I uh, have one particular student who I think will always linger in our memory as, um, <laughs> as, as, as somebody with tremendous depth and potential who just could mm -hmm. not express herself on paper and probably never will. And um, trying to trying to help that student dig up what she really has to contribute, um, and somehow still get it on paper in a way that I can you know I can I can then understand I can follow. Um, that was really hard, it, and it will always you know we'll always have these students who sort of like really push that. Um, I've given a lot of thought about how. Um, how much time I want to spend. I mean, I'm so glad that with IS I feel a little bit more freedom about content. Like I can, I can focus more on content and I don't have to be as, um, as demanding about certain structures in the writing, right? But um, I still want to know what they're talking about. And so I'm trying to set up um, questions and projects and responses and, um, and writing assignments that do not need to follow that particular structure in order for me to understand what the student's trying to get across. So that I don't have to be looking for a topic sentence. Because somehow what the student, you know, there's a question in there, if the student answers this particular question to start with, then we're set. Like I understand what this is going to be about. And I don't have to try and track down something that follows a certain set expectation. But that's that's tricky because it also requires a shift in all of us in terms of what we are looking for and how open we are to going where the students at not just in terms of okay the student will not use a verb agreement which you know i've lived on but um but also but also figuring out like how to how to find the content how to find the material that the student is trying to get across and helping that student get that across in an authentic way um i use i find that reflection for example as a setup um, is much more easily fulfilled by students in general. And I can understand what they're trying to say if I say, how do you feel about that? Or how do you, have you encountered this in your own life? Making it more, more um, straightforward in that way as a response and more real, as opposed to saying, I want to see this paper. You know, like that. So yeah. basically setting up the writing assignments in ways that make it easier for them to speak in their own voice and also don't get them sidetracked on like what I might be expecting to read. Right. So, right, because then they're spending so much time trying to set up some sort of paper structure that they really, that is super artificial. It's just something that we do in educate, like in, in, in our education system, but really yeah. it's not a real thing, right? And it, it, right. And it also gives them a sense, a, a chance to, to write without worries about is it well organized? It doesn't have to be. Um, and and what's really interesting at the end is they see that they how much they've written because yeah. inevitably they start with you know two or three lines. This is what I think, and that's it. And there's no why I think so or how so. 
Um, and then with prodding, it takes months but with or weeks, but it, with prodding, you suddenly start explaining. And especially if, if they're um, if it's something that they really value, like you mentioned, Black Lives Matter, or it could be anything of, you know, my cousin did whatever, and this really, you know. It's meaningful, right? It has to be meaningful. Yeah. Meaning, right. And then they go on, and I just let them. It doesn't matter if they, it's full of riddled with mistakes, and, and but it's, it's almost like they, they have to get it out. And that, you know, look how much you've written. Yeah. You, know, you can use those ideas later on. Um, but in their and, and what I see often is in their minds, they're sort of compartmentalized. I'm done with this. I'm not going to go back and revisit. <laughs> Instead of no, you do need to pull things out of here to use in your paper. But it's I've done it. We're done. We move on. But to also, it. we don't. I mean, also once you say I need a paper, then they start agonizing right. over the introductory paragraph and the thesis yeah. statement and their yeah. topic analysis and. When really, if you can create a project that's more natural, yeah. and they right. don't the have that panic mode, yeah. um, it does, you usually get better content. Yeah. And if yeah. I'm just looking for content, I just want to know, did they understand this? Do they understand how it fits into something else? Can they synthesize mm -hmm. the information? Can they connect it with what we've done earlier? So I don't need to see a paper uh -huh. with Right. You know, the topic sentence and so on. Although, I mean, I, I, I value it. Lisa, don't get me wrong. I love it when there is one, right? <laughs> but, um, but I just don't want that to stand between me, that expectation, which yeah. is, after all, a very, you know, like higher mm -hmm. education or also like just basic standardized education based expectation, right? Mm -hmm. And if that becomes the block between me and understanding what the student is doing or wants to do, then um, then it's not helpful. Yeah. So do we wish that they would gain that kind of control over their writing and over their thinking? Yeah. Possibly, but there's only one way that students or people in general, you know, human beings organize their thoughts and their processes. So it's the way that we tend to value. But I think there might be a lot of different ways. Like when you think of oral traditions, for example, oh, in their repetition, can set very, very circular, yeah. very circular, right? So yeah. that's all fascinating stuff. I'm open, you know, mm -hmm. I'm open. I don't need it to be, but I think it, it's a process for us to actually decide, really decide that that's an okay way to create a project or deliver an answer or something. And if you, you know, it, it's hard to do that with the research paper. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it also comes down to, once again, your... Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah, absolutely comes down again to your learning objectives. I don't have English standards in my learning objectives. Therefore, how can I justify taking off points or requiring them to use proper grammar as long as I can understand what they're saying? Do I in my master's classes? Yes, I absolutely do because you're a teacher. You need to be able to write. Mm -hmm. But in my, in my computer science class, I don't have them write papers. But if I did, I would... I'm with Julia. As long as I can understand what you're saying, it's good. Now, that's probably different because your learning objectives are more writing focused so yeah. so you have to decide which i mean that that's kind of the, the decision the rock and the hard place <laughs> between which you are stuck right now um yeah. but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the same way i don't put it on my rubric and therefore they're not losing any points for it i'll tell them hey i, I don't I, I have no idea what this means because you i mean I don't, I don't know what you're saying here but but even if it is on the rubric can it just have a certain point value? Yeah, because mine is just like three points. <laughs> because well, yeah, and it's even sidetracked. Without a rubric, I would get sidetracked, and I would say, "Oh my God, this paper is a mess." And therefore, it is not even getting a seat. But then I realized that I was not giving points for having done interesting research, for having had an interesting idea, for having you know, for doing some engaging things with language, and so with a rubric that really helped me. Um, focus on a variety of things that I was evaluating as opposed to like, oh my god, this paper is awful, right? Yeah. Or, oh my god, this paper is brilliant because, you know, the citations are correct or, <laughs> you know, they, like, there are no fragments. That stuff will sidetrack us, I think, because of I these agree. expectations that we do have. Especially those of us who are English teachers and we're trained on that, or, or education yeah. teachers and we're trained on looking for those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think, too, going off of what Julia is saying, one of the really beneficial things I've taken from our conversation is focusing on uh, mastery of 
the most important thing, right? Or, right, or not even mastery, but yeah. focusing on understanding of uh, core concepts or, or big ideas, right? Because, um, uh, you know, I mean, there are elements of education that are always journey-based, which is, which is to say something you do in a 100-level class uh, gets built on a 200-level class and so on and so on. And I think um, keeping those big-picture things in mind is a really good thing I'm taking from our conversation. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you, Peter. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I need to go, but thank you for this. Thank you. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm going to have to head out in a couple as well. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions or anything else? to? This has been a wonderful discussion. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, as always, if you have any questions or anything I can do to help, please shoot me an email. I love it. Thanks. See you all later.